So we will give it up for our Greensboro family this morning. Do this in honor of God, just in honor of church, in honor of each other. Stand up this morning. Find somebody you didn't come with. Greensboro, stand up. If you're at home, st stand up as well. Find somebody you didn't come with. Tell them how good it is to be in church. You guys can be seated. Greensboro, good morning. Love you guys. Had a great time with you last week. Everybody here was glowing about you. You're way above average. You're beautiful. Welcome to church. Uh, is it the last Sunday of April or is there one more? Is this it? Is this the last Sunday of April? Next week is May. And then May the 4th be with you is coming soon, all you Star Wars people. <laughs> We've got a lot of people watching everywhere. John, North Carolina as well. Doug and Marlene in Florida. How are things in Florida? Ellie, New Jersey. Christy, Georgia. Kim, South Carolina. Phil, Alice, PA. Camilla in Texas. Michelle in Maryland. Kara in Wisconsin. And all of our brothers and sisters in oh, Canada. That's my moment there. Give it up for everybody, both campuses. I love it. 1956, Johnny Cash released a record. Our teenagers Wednesday night had no idea what I was talking about when I showed them this picture that'll come on the screen. The record that Johnny Cash would release, the A side of the record was I Walk the Line. Who's ever heard of Johnny Cash? Who's ever heard of I Walk the Line? On the B side of the record, Jay, which all the teens were like, what, B side? What song was on the B side of the record, I Walked the Line, which was a smashed hit? Get Rhythm. When you got the blues, get rhythm. <laughs> I love it, right? What a great song. But it was forgotten. People didn't hear it. They didn't. I Walked the Line was the smash hit, so Johnny Cash was smart. 14 years later, 1969, he re-released Get Rhythm. It kind of jumped to 23rd. It landed at number 23 on the country 100 hits. A, lot, a little known fact about the song is Johnny Cash wrote it for who? Elvis Presley. But Johnny Cash's manager said, no, Johnny, you're going to release the song. And I'm glad he wrote this incredible standard of the church today. <laughs> what a theologically perfect song. This series is entitled Rhythm. It's two years in the making. In March of 2020, when the pandemic hit, we all went home for two weeks to curve the infection. I said it. I was a prophet. I want you to go ahead and pat me on the back as your preacher because I made a statement. And when we jumped back in church, we were one of the first churches to open, and we closed for almost, I think, six weeks. Whew. I made this statement behind the scenes, and then I made it publicly. Spiritual rhythm is going to get us as a society. It's going to kill us. And what we have now gone through, when I said it two years ago, is really going to hurt. You fast forward to last week when we were unified at the Sevierville Convention Center, and I walked that corridor for an hour before church and an hour after church, and I saw lots of people that I haven't seen in church in a long time. And I love them. I'm hoping you're back as well. And you know what they would say to me? I know, preacher. I know I should have been in church. I just got out of rhythm. Rhythm. Gloria Estefan was right. I made that statement two years ago. And boy, it's true. The rhythm is going to get you if you don't watch it. Rhythm is going to get you. Rhythm is going to get you. Rhythm is going to get you. <laughs> Rhythm is going to get you. I mean, right? That's, that's all I got, man. That's all I got. It's true. So people go, well, Brent, I don't have a lot of rhythm. Horse hockey, you have a lot of rhythm. Life revolves around rhythm. Everything about life is, is around rhythm. God created us. God created all things. He created us as human beings. He created the heavens and the earth. And you can see rhythm everywhere. First off, the definition of rhythm. Take some notes, write some things down. This is going to be, in the words of my friend Dan Seaborn, st so stinking simple. I can hear Dan say it now. So stinking simple. 
with his little Barney Fife. You know, I stole, I mean, I, but this message is so simple, but it's so needed. So rhythm, started thinking about this often and a lot the last few years, a strong, regular, repeated pattern of movement. That's the definition of rhythm. The key in the whole phrase, in my opinion, is movement, repeated patterns of movement. Life revolves around rhythm. I could say this, you and I live our best life when we revolve it around rhythms. Parents of students, you know this, right? They are better when they are in a pattern of repeated movement. They go to school, they have structure, that rhythm. See, in America, we've taken the word rhythm and thrown it out, and we've put the word routine or obligation in instead. And a lot of us were like, oh, I want to break my routine. I'm so tired. I think I'm going to become an RVer. I'm just going to travel. Javon and I are doing that next year, by the way. We sold our home. We're going to get an RV, and I'll be preaching along the road. But a lot of us don't realize that, you know what, our life is better around the rhythms of life. It's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. We've made it a bad thing. And when we break our routine and break really some things that matter, we don't live the very best life. God created us with rhythm in mind. You're like, what are you talking about? Go to the heartbeat. The heartbeat. If you think about the heartbeat, a heartbeat really works best in rhythm. If you're, if you're heartbeat, if you're, is it arrhythmic? If you're not rhythmic when it comes to your heart, uh, they're going to shock it back into place. They're going to do things. It's not good for your heart to be out of rhythm. The oxygen in, we breathe out, in, out, in, out. The march of our steps every single day to get us to where we're going. Life revolves around rhythm. Look at the natural world. Look at God who created the heavens and the earth. You think about the rhythms of our world, whether it's the earth revolving around the sun, the moon, orbiting the earth, and it brings tides. Think of the the rhythm in our world. Some of you go to the beach and you see high tides and you see low tides and there's a rhythm to that. Some of you fishermen, you love that those tides moving in and out. Rhythm. If you're on the beach, you're in precarious situations, your life might depend on you understanding the tides. The seasons. Our world is about rhythm. Winter, spring, summer, fall. Who's a springtime person? Let's see your hands. This is your favorite time of the year. Springtime, sponsored by Nasacourt, right? (laughs) I don't know about Greensboro, but man, forget washing your car. You wash it the next day, it's green. Has anybody felt weird with all the pollen in the air? You springtime people, summertime. That's your favorite time. You're like, oh, I love the summer, fall. A lot of people, East Tennessee, we like the leaves. Who are the weird ones among us? Winter time. All the pale people unite. I like it. (laughs) It's amazing to think about rhythm. Life revolves around rhythm. So my question, naturally, is do you have rhythm? You're like, not really. Yes, I'm telling you, even our heart, shouts that we are people of rhythm. So let's have some fun. Let's have a little interactive. I couldn't do a series on rhythm without seeing how rhythmic you are. So we're going to do this. Greensboro, pay attention because this section over here, far section, you're a foot stomp. Stomp your feet. Ready? All right. This section here, you're a hand clap. Greensboro, this section here, right? You're a hand clap. Ready? Clap your hands. All right. This section, Greensboro, my left side here, Greensboro, you're the woo. One, two, three. You guys got it easy. You're the finger snap. One, two, three. All right, so you got rhythm. We're going to play a little game. Here's what's going to happen. When the circles come together, you got to do what I ask you to do. So ready, foot stomp. All right, you got it. Hand clap. Here we go. Ready? Wait, wait. There you go. The woos, greens come together. Woo! And the finger snap. Wait for it. Takes a minute. And all right, everybody ready? Let's see how you do. We'll play a little game. See if you got rhythm. Come on. Woo! Woo! Do your part. Finger snap. You're not up yet. Woo! Come on. Come on, foot stompers. Keep going. 
How'd you do? How'd the person to your left or right do? Be honest. Come on. Some of you, I was listening. Some of you in this room, you're a little rhythm impaired. We are people of spiritual rhythm. Spiritual rhythm matters. You're like, well, Brent, I'm not really rhythmic. In the busyness of the world and the storms of life, we can get disillusioned, we can get discouraged, we can just want to stop, we can get bogged down. But all of us are people of rhythm. We're either going to follow cultural rhythm, what the culture tells us to do, and we get tuned into the culture, or godly rhythm. So the message is simple, but I'm challenged by it. I believe I need to speak on it. We're going to have some twists and turns over the next few weeks. We're going to talk about spiritual rhythm and what that means and the rhythms of life and be challenged by God's word. I'm a Bible guy and a Jesus guy, and I want you to be challenged as well. I want you to think about a few things. We're going to start in, the, in, in Matthew chapter 11. You have your Bibles. We're going to jump to Psalm 119 right in the middle of the Bible, and we're going to close in the New Testament book of James chapter 1. I want you to listen. My goal is to be done at five minutes till um, the hour. Scott's going to come sing a song. I don't want you to leave. I don't want you to rush around. All of us are so busy. We rush, 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 rush that we've got to stop and think about some things. And we're going to talk about that. Rhythm is, is important. Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30, Jesus is talking He's going to give us, and I want you to listen to the rhythms of God's Word today. He's going to give us a really a spiritual rhythm to live by. I'm going to read it in the um, the NIV, the New International Version, and I'm going to jump to the message paraphrase, which really brings the Bible to life. I want to read it two different ways, and I want you to listen as we lock in on God's Word this morning on some rhythms that, that are important to us. I want you to see if you can hear it and then be challenged by it. Come to me, Jesus says, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You're like, Brian, I don't quite understand what that means. So, This is an incredible, the message paraphrase is real life conversation, so it puts it in real life vocabulary, and listen to it in the message because it really brings it to life. Think of the words of Jesus speaking to us in our vocabulary today. Here we go. Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me, Jesus says. Get away with me. You'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me. Work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me, and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Case in point, Wednesday night before church, Pastor Matt, by the way, Matt was up here this morning playing harmonica for this song. By the way, Scotty in Greensboro, you killed it, singing and playing harp. Way to go, buddy. All of us together, let's say, go, Scotty, go. go, Scotty, go. Or beam me up, Scotty. I mean, one or the other, that was awesome. But Pastor Matt, some of you saw him here. He had his sunglasses on. Uh, Matt had LASIK eye surgery on Friday and was still here this week, but had to wear the sunglasses. Matt and I were talking Wednesday, and he came up to me before the message started, and I said, hey, how was youth going tonight? He's like, it's going good. And he goes, I just got through with a counseling appointment with a 13-year-old. And the appointment goes like this. Hey, Matt, I'm just tired of life. I'm so over it. I'm over the drama at home. I'm over school. I'm just over it all. I'm worn out. A lot of us can relate. We're burned out. We're worn out. We're tired. We're weary. And there's a reason for that. There's a big time reason. And that's what I'm after. I want you to pay attention to your life and the rhythms that flow in you and through you. Is it a cultural rhythm? Are we all about the culture? Or is it a godly rhythm? If you want to find peace... 
If you're worn out, if you're tired, if you're burned out, even on religion. I'm not pushing a religion. I don't even like religious people. Shh. It's a relationship with God. It's the rhythms of life. Our best life is when we lock in on godly rhythm. So Psalm 119 is right in the middle of the Bible. We don't know who wrote Psalm 119. Most theologians would say David. Some would say Ezra. Some might even say Daniel. Psalm 119 is the longest chapter in the Bible. We're going to read all of the verses. No. We're going to start in verse 161. We're going to read through verse 169. If you go and read Psalm 119, you can almost hear how important God's word is in every single verse. It's the truth that God's word stands up. It matters. It's needed as we build God's word into the spiritual rhythms of our lives. We don't just say, well, my schedule is too tight to put God's word in. We actually build a framework around God's word into our schedules. Do we do that? So I want to read, if you have your Bibles, open it up to Psalm 119, verse 161. I want to read for a minute. I want you to listen once again to a spiritual rhythm that's being put into this psalmist's life and ask yourself, be challenged, because I sure have, is this me? Is this you? Powerful people harass me without cause, but my heart trembles only at your word. You could stop and preach a whole message on that. Some of you are like, Brent, I'm sure you could. Do we listen to what people say about us or do we lock in on God's word? I rejoice in your word like one who discovers a great treasure. Wow. I hate and abhor all falsehood, but I love your instructions. Listen to the rhythm. I will praise you seven times a day because all your regulations are just. Those who love your instructions have great peace and do not stumble. I long for your rescue, Lord. So I have obeyed your commands. I have obeyed your laws, for I love them very much. Yes, I obey your commandments and laws because you know everything I do. Did you hear the rhythm that makes a difference in someone's life? I will praise you seven times a day, the psalmist says. See, a lot of us today as Christians, we make fun of people that are really what we would call regimented. They really lock in on certain things that they do every single day, and we're like, well, that's just too much routine. That's just too much obligation. That's not how I roll. I go back to 2016. I was on a plane in January 2016. Several of us were heading to Israel to shoot video for the Epic series. Uh, it was a 14-hour flight from JFK to Tel Aviv. Long flight to spend a lot of time in a little place with a lot of people. And in the middle of the night, we're all trying to sleep. All of a sudden, it was very disconcerting when 60 Orthodox Jews stood up. They got all of their stuff down from their um, the carry-on compartment. They put on all their prayer shawls. They got their Bibles out. They got everything they needed to do. And they stood in the aisle. And they did this multiple times on the flight. And they prayed in the aisle over your shoulder. It was disconcerting. I'd never experienced that before. You're like, Brent, they didn't do that. I'll show you a picture. This was the man standing next to me over my shoulder. And several times throughout this flight, they would get up and they would stand there. They would nod. They would pray. He was right over my shoulder. He looks like uh, a little bit like Charlie Daniels. I get that. And this is the story that happened. Of course, I am not praying I have my headphones in. I have my iPad. I'm watching the movie Gladiator because I don't sleep well. This man is supposed to be praying when he tapped me on the shoulder and he looked at me and he goes, that's a good movie. <laughs> Gave me the thumbs up. True story. It happened. I'll, I always love to tell that. He prayed and I thought, man, this is, in my mind, right, this is crazy. You can pray sitting down at your seat. Yeah, okay. But they did it. They, they get up, they're regimented to what they do, and it's, it's, it's very, very built into their Jewish faith. Muslims, 
You go to Israel, I've been to places where Muslims, they will pray toward Mecca five times a day. They will literally stop, they'll get on their knees, they'll put their rug out, they'll figure out which way Mecca is, they'll pray, and we as Christians, we walk by them in Israel, and they're praying, and we're like, what is going, that's crazy. How would they, why would they do that five times a day as we go try to find ice cream or something? Well, what is going, we make fun of that. We do. We're like, well, that's, that seems a lot. Today, how much do we stop throughout our every day and give God praise? Wonder why we're so worn out and tired and weary. Wonder why we're so overwhelmed. It's amazing to think about spiritual rhythm, godly rhythm versus cultural rhythm. Many of us, who we will bend over backwards to make sure that we do everything that the culture tells us to do. As parents, we will bend over backwards to make sure our kids are into every kind of sport, every kind of activity, because you're, you're, you're right, Brent. Hey, rhythm is important. That is good for them. But yet when it comes to spiritual rhythm, when it comes to things of God, first and foremost, our time alone with God, that's definitely a back burner issue. We don't really spend a lot of time. The rhythms of life, things that most Christians don't prioritize. You're going to look at me and you're going, Brent, I've heard this and I've heard it. This is simple and you are right. You've heard it more than likely and it's simple, but boy, it's needed. I am convicted by this. How do we build spiritual rhythm into our life, the rhythms of life? Number one, write it down. To build rhythm, you first have to stop. And you're like, Brent, that does not make sense. Rhythm doesn't mean stopping. I thought rhythm is kind of a good, good beat. It's going. It's moving. But without stopping and starting, there is no rhythm. David Lee plays the drums here. we got great musicians here, our Greensboro campus. I played drums for several years in the Sevierville Civic Center. Who was around when I played drums? Some of you, 14 of you, you remember those days when I played the drums. I did not know how to play the drums. I got a DVD, an instructional DVD from Cindy Lauper's drummer <laughs> that I bought. And I listened to that instructional DVD for three weeks, and then I played drums in the church for over two years. You're like, Brent, you're just so talented. Hold on. I learned a basic beat. Four, four times. Some of you know this. Uh, in, on a drum kit, beat one is the kick drum. Two is the snare. Three is the kick drum. Four is the snare. You learn to keep time. So one and two and three and four and one. And boom, I was just a decent timekeeper. Do you realize drummers that are good are not playing the drums constantly? It's not like David is up there with this drum solo on steroids. <laughs> he keeps the beats. The best songs that you know, the drummer's got the beat. He's stopping and starting. You don't realize that, but there are times that he actually stops. He hits, he stops. He hits, he stops. Then you've got our musicians. You've got Gus, who begins to fill. You've got Marty. You listen to a bass player. He is finding, he is weaving, he is breathing into that song. He is finding the space in between the beat. Jim is finding the space. Scott, finding the space in between the beat. Some of our greatest songs that you love, because we get hooked on the rhythm way before we get hooked on the rhyme. As you feel musicians breathing and stopping and starting and, and working and finding and flowing off of that beat. Spiritual rhythm is exactly the same. Spiritual rhythm is not just us going 1,400 miles an hour all the time. It feels like that's how we live our lives with one big, ah! we never stop, not even at night. We have a whole generation of kids that have to sleep with their television on. They can't stop. We can't stop. I, I'm the same way. If I don't watch it, I can lay my head down in a very dark room, the TV off, everything, and my mind does not stop. It almost seems like there is a systematic attack from the enemy, Satan, who wants to kill our lives, destroy our rhythm, that we cannot stop and remember the things of God. I'm just asking, when do you do that? You're like, Brent, I've heard that. 
I really don't do that, I know, but. The second word is center or centering. We can put the word focus in there, paying attention, because we can't, in our society, I can't just preach, all right, let's just stop and remember the things of God because in our stopping, we still don't give God the center of attention. Many of us struggle. We're out of center. Some of us will say we're out of balance. You're like, Brent, centering, it sounds like a yoga term. But think about this. It's interesting. Clear indicators. I read this a couple of weeks ago that we as a society, as people, are out of center. We're out of kilter. We're out of balance. We're not really focusing on what really matters to live our best life the way God intended it for us to live. Think about this. Just be challenged by it. Clear indicators that you and I are struggling. We're out of center. Throughout the day, we are reactive. We check our phones compulsively. We fail to differentiate what is urgent and what is important in life. We feel fatigued early in the day. In our mental and emotional state, we're consumed by negative thoughts. We're easily distracted. Squirrel, right? I mean, we're easily distracted, out of focus, obsess about the past, and have a bunch of anxiety about the future. Am I I getting warm? Some of you are like, he's reading my Facebook. We get stuck. We're high strung. We're overwhelmed. In the evening, you, you end your work day depleted. You struggle with impulse control, sugar, social media, alcohol, snacks, drugs, porn, shopping, you name it, we struggle. We can't remember what we did yesterday. We go to sleep way too late or we crash way too early. Did I hit on anyone? Let's see some hands. Did you're like, (gasps) I'm out of center. So here's why I would say all this. When you read God's word and I'd say, hey, just stop, you got to go a little bit further than that because the Bible says in Psalm 37, 7, be still before the Lord and wait patiently on him. That is incredibly hard in our culture. Psalm 46, 10, be still and know that God is God. We've preached that many times and I'll keep preaching it because it's huge in our lives. We got to cut the noise to listen to God's still small voice. We want God to bring the lightning and thunder, but he will bring the whisper. Centering is where we move into God's presence and rest there. A time of quiet contemplation, meditation, reflection, quieting your mind. The last is, well, there's two more, but the last one really as we lock in on what we can do is to be silent. Silence or listening. You're like, Brent, I know that. This, you kind of just said that. Well, it's different because so many times we spend when we stop and we kind of give God our moments, we don't listen for God's voice. We tell God what we need. We give God our business and we remind God of his business. And we don't stop and we don't listen. Some of the greatest advice ever given to me in my life is to listen just to stop and listen, not just when I pray, all right, God, I'm just going to give you this one-way street. I'm going to tell you what you need to hear from me. I'm going to listen. When I stop and I put God in the center of my attention, I really be, intent- I really be intentional about that. And there is something, by the way, to praying. There's something to standing, the Jewish faith, the Muslim faith. If you think about how incredibly rigid they are and they prioritize these moments uh, each and every day to pray, many of us, you know, it's hard for me to lay my head flat down on my pillow and I pray because I'm like, out. It's hard for me to sit in front of the television and say, all right, God, I'm going to pray. It's hard for me to have my phone in my hand and say, all right, I'm going to pray. You realize for me, as simple as I try to make it in my life and as childlike faith as I have in my life, sometimes I literally get on my knees. Sometimes I lay flat down. I don't get all the way down, but I almost do the plank. I sit. I have to find ways to, to really pay attention and to lower and bow my life before God and say, God, I need you. You're like, Brent, you don't do that. Why don't you do that? 
I've told the story of my grandparents for years, talking about putting me to shame. My mom's mom and dad were some of the greatest Christians I ever knew. They did not own a television. I know that was a long time ago. But I would go to their house in Ashland, Kentucky, and I would see the carpet worn so much because they would kneel at their chair in their living room every single night and pray. Their, their knee prints were worn in the carpet. That's how you know you live it and you don't just talk about it. It's amazing to think about what we have lost as a society. How, how is it working for us? Silence and solitude are probably the most taken for granted lost disciplines of the Christian life. And I want you to listen to this statement. This quote really has whoo, made me think. Without solitude, it is almost impossible to live a spiritual life. I will make a statement. You can disagree with me. But I will say this. Without corporate worship, Christians coming together to worship God and be challenged in these captive moments, it is really hard to live a victorious Christian life. And I will go to the opposite end of the direction. If you and I don't build in moments of solitude in our life, it's almost impossible to live a victorious Christian life. Scripture is number four. Psalm 119, verses 105 is probably one of my all-time favorite verses in the Bible. It really, it really gives me that what I need as I lock in on God's word. Your word, God, is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. A lamp to my feet. When that trail in life is dark and I don't know where I'm going, I need a light shining to guide me and to direct me and to give me what I need. If you can't remember anything else, remember this. Rhythm really flows from the inside out. Inside out flow. Throughout the Gospels, we see Jesus. He would minister, but then he would withdraw from the crowds. He would go pray alone in a quiet place, by a lake, in the hills, um, in, in the desert, up the mountains. He would really share his heart with God. He would pray and meditate on Scripture. He would listen to God. He would submit to God, his Father's leadership, and he would obey. So two things to close, and there will be a QR code that will come on the screen. I would like for all of us to take a challenge. I would like for all of us to build, once again, God's word, the truth for our lives. God's word is a treasure that we need to be reminded of, hey, this is really where we can get life and build spiritual rhythm. If you have your phone, you can get it out, your camera, you can take a picture of that. There's a 31-day version reading plan. A lot of you have the version Bible app. The reading plan is entitled, It is Written. It's 31 days. It's really championing and celebrating the, really the truth of God's word. And I want us all to lock in on this together. I would say this would be a New Year's resolution in April, but I'm going to throw out the word resolution from here on out. I'm going to say this. It's time for us to lock in on rhythms and not resolutions. Lock in on this. Take the challenge. Stop. Give God the center of attention. Listen. When you listen, a part of that is reading God's word. And you're like, Brent, what are you talking about? I've heard this before. Yes, you and I have heard it. But here's what James chapter 1, verse 22 through 25 says. But don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you are only fooling yourself. For if you listen to the word and don't obey it, it's like glancing at your face in a mirror you see yourself, you walk away, and you forget what you look like. But if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free, and if you do what it says and don't forget what you heard, God will bless you. God's super, the word bless, God's super on our natural. You're like, Brent, this is so stinking simple, but I've been so challenged by this last year, and I'm not, I, I hate to even bring it up, but I'll bring it up one more time. I'm sick of the term, the new normal, because in a lot of Christians' life, the new normal is for us not to build spiritual rhythm into godly things, but it's to lock in on that cultural rhythm and walk away from the things of God. That is true. 
Don't be swallowed up. So what I want to do to, to end this service, and Greensboro is going to stay with us, and I don't want you to leave. I want to, for Scott to sing a song. Gus is going to play. Scott's going to sing. The song is simple. It's entitled, Be Still and Know That God is God. Listen to the words. Be challenged by them. God, be in this moment as we close week one of this series. May this be really rising up in our lives and resonate in our hearts and minds. In Jesus' name, amen.